Hi folks, I'm Adam. This is the Machine Tech Video Blog, and today I just want to do a quick and dirty little introduction to a super, super useful inspection tool, which for some reason is relatively little known in the wider machinist community, and that is the shallow diameter gauge. Here's a question for you. Have you ever had to measure a part like this that has relatively large but shallow diameters that have to be held to, you know, pretty tight tolerances like plus or minus a thousandth of an inch or something like that? I used to have to do this type of work all the time when I worked for the water company because these types of um, inside diameters uh, usually mate with, again, very shallow outside diameters that are used as register fits when you're uh, you know, stacking components uh, on top of one another, like pump bowls or something like that. Well, it turns out that this is really not that easy of a thing to measure. I mean, you can't really get an inside mic down in there. You can't really get a telescoping gauge down in there. Uh, probably the most obvious thing to grab that is sort of part of the standard assortment of machinists tools that you'd find in your toolbox would be a vernier caliper right? I mean, preferably vernier calipers. And that could get down in there and you could get a measurement, right? But your measurement accuracy would only be about, you know, within a couple of thousandths of an inch. And that may or may not be good enough. It's usually not good enough for register fits. But it turns out that there is a special purpose tool for measuring exactly this type of thing called a shallow diameter gauge. I think these things are really, really cool. They're one of my favorite specialty gauges, and they're not particularly difficult to make, actually. I have made some custom versions of this before for really specific applications. Uh, in particular, the one I'm thinking of is uh, measuring the diameter of radial dovetails, and we have to make one of these with special contact points. But in any case, the point is that they're quite simple. So if I flip this over, you'll see this stylus right here. It's sort of the rounded, tapered head of a fastener. Uh, and this is fixed. I mean, it, it can, it's adjustable, right? I mean, you can move its position in this slot, but you know, you lock it down. And then over here, we have another very similar stylus, but this actually can move because it's attached to the end of this flexure. This is a very, very simple flexure, just made out of spring steel. And you can see that there are four blades in total, two on each side. Uh, and it doesn't need to be two. It could just be uh, one on each side if it was relatively wide. It's two here simply because you need to get access to the center of the flexure. Um, but if it were wide enough, you know, the whole point here is just to limit uh, torsional movement in this direction. And this is the type of movement that you get. Uh, it basically constrains that little contact point, that anvil, to a straight line movement. It's actually not quite a straight line. Uh, it moves it in a very, very large radius arc, okay? But over very, very short distances, it's basically a straight line. This type of flexure, by the way, is called a blade flexure, or actually this book refers to it as a leaf flexure. It's the same thing. And you can see in this diagram uh, a sort of arrangement which is very, very similar to what we've got going on on that gauge. And in this diagram, you can see the sort of path of motion where the two blades buckle to deform as you push on this top platform to move left and right. The anvil touches the tip of an indicator, a tenths reading drop indicator. Uh, and so when you push on the stylus here, you also depress the plunger on the indicator. And that's how you get your readings. So this is a comparative gauge, okay? You're not gonna get an absolute direct reading off of a diameter. Uh, you have to set this off of a standard, right? Something of known size. And then you compare your part to that size that the gauge was zeroed off of. So like I said, the idea behind the basic construction is very simple. Uh, there are a couple of other things here. So there are these spherical contacts that sit down on a flat surface uh, so that you can always have the same sort of attitude uh, to your measurement. You're never uh, measuring cocked out at some angle because that would of course change the values. Uh, and all of these things are adjustable. I mean, the position of the indicator is adjustable. Um, 
This uh, stylus, which I already mentioned, is adjustable. The spherical contacts are adjustable. Uh, the position of the flexure is adjustable. And uh, the anvil there uh, can also be adjusted just with a, well, I mean, it's a set screw, basically. But without further ado, let's measure something with this thing. Let's imagine that the print for this part right here calls out this diameter, the one that's been marked in black, as 3 inches, 167 thousandths, plus or minus 1, whatever it is, whatever the tolerance is. The point is that this gauge needs to be set off of a length standard, right? And then we're going to be measuring deviations of this diameter from that setting point. And the length standard needs to be 3 inches, 167 thousandths. Now, we could make a custom standard, but that would be pretty time-consuming and expensive, and it wouldn't really be worth it unless we were going to make this measurement, like, a whole bunch of times. So, in a machine shop, we're much more likely to use gauge blocks. Gauge blocks are great for making custom length standards for setting tools in this way. So here I've got a custom stack already made. So this is 120, 147, 902, and that adds up to 3 inches, 167. These blocks are not in particularly good shape. These are just my, my beater blocks here. Um, but, you know, for demonstration purposes, I think it'll be fine. If we were measuring a shallow external diameter, then we would be setting the distance to the insides of the styli here, and then we could just jam the gauge block set in between those, and we could set it that way. But since we're setting an internal shallow diameter, we're going to be setting the outsides uh, of the styli there, right? So basically that. And what we need to do in order to do this uh, is we have to extend these surfaces somehow. There are various accessories that are designed specifically to do this thing that I'm trying to do here, but I don't have any of them here in my garage shop, so we're going to have to improvise. Now, by the way, there is a special type of gauge block called a Hoke block, which is really only used in the United States, but it's designed to do this thing, all right, for making uh, specialty length standards. And those are the uh, square blocks that have the holes through them. If you've ever seen those, that's what they're for. Anyway, what I'm going to do here is I'm going to sandwich the gauge block stack between two good quality one, two, three blocks. And then I'm going to lightly clamp those all together with this C-clamp. I know that looks completely ridiculous, just bear with me. So the idea here is to sort of preload that stylus that's attached to the flexure, uh, and then let the gauge sit on the three spherical contacts. And then I'm gonna use that stylus right there as a sort of pivot point, and rock this through until you find the smallest value, okay? Because if you're at an angle this way or this way, then you're going to get a bigger reading, okay? So what you really want is the smallest value. So it's like this. You see how there's like a point at which the, the pointer here sort of finds its position and then it goes back the other way? Right? It's like it's climbing, it's climbing, it's climbing, and then it goes back down the other way like that, right? So that point where it sort of reverses its position is the smallest value directly across the two one, two, three blocks, right? So that's the actual uh, length of our gauge block there. And so I've already got this set to zero, but if you needed to adjust it, right, you could use an Allen wrench and uh, move the anvil in and out on the flexure, or you could turn the entire dial face here. And now that it's set, I can transfer that measurement to the part. Okay, so something like this. We'll preload that stylus. Okay, we're down. We're down on the spherical contacts. Okay, and then rock it through to find that low spot there. And yeah, so we can see that that right there is the spot. And so that is uh, in the clockwise direction from zero. So that's one thousandths and I don't know, let's call that two tenths. And which direction is it out in? So if I push on the stylus in this direction, that moves the pointer clockwise. Uh, this indicator is a little bit sticky. Uh, but in any case, so if it's if it's off in the clockwise direction, then that means 
that the hole is slightly smaller in diameter than what we set on the gauge. Anyway, there you go. So a simple and effective means by which you can check the size of shallow diameters, both internal uh, diameters like we have here and external diameters. So whatever part mates to this is going to have some protruding external diameter from a, a flange face. Uh, and that is going to be a relatively tight fit, tight register fit to this. And so you can use this tool to check that as well. So for those of you who are interested, this is that custom tool that I was talking about earlier. This is something I worked on when I was at Lawrence Berkeley National Laboratory, uh, working with Tom Lipton, better known as Ox Tools. He was actually the one who designed this tool. Uh, and then a couple of us actually built it. The construction is pretty basic. So the body is this long aluminum dog bone shape. And then on one side, there's this spool that's got a cylinder with two uh, discs on either end. That rides in this slot. And uh, you can move it around with this long piece of threaded rod. That's what that's supposed to be. That's attached to the end of a knob. And on the bottom of the spool, is a stylus and this one has a very specific radius on it uh, and I'll talk about the application in just a moment but this had to be custom made. On the other side of the gauge is of course another stylus and that is attached to one of those double blade parallel flexures that I was showing before. There you go. That's a lot easier to see if I create a section view of the body. So this is nearly identical to the commercial variant, which I showed before. Uh, and of course, there's an indicator which is bearing on this anvil. So there you go. That's an option for a DIY version. Hopefully you'll permit me a slight digression here, because the application for this tool was really, really interesting. It was used to manufacture this ridiculous pool noodle looking thing, which is a superconducting dipole magnet uh, used in a medical gantry device for ion therapy, basically zapping cancerous tumors with charged particles. If you look closely at this picture, you'll see these sort of bronze-colored wires of superconducting material, uh, which are wrapped around and jammed into grooves or channels, which take a helical path around the outside periphery of the magnet. This particular groove geometry has a special name, by the way. It's canted cosine theta, or CCT. That's the name of the geometry there. And if you're wondering, that sort of blue stuff that's smeared on the outside is a type of epoxy which was used to pot the, uh, the wires into the grooves. So this project required making two nearly identical magnets. And you can see both of them in this picture. That's me, by the way, in the, uh, the hard hat. <laughs> so one of them was slightly larger than the other, so that got slipped over top of the smaller one. And I don't know how well you can make this out in the pictures, but the directions of the helical grooves on each one was sort of opposite. And this was all about controlling the shape of the magnetic field inside of the magnet. Anyway, the thing that I really wanted to point out here was that you can clearly see in these pictures that the main structure of the magnet was built in sections, right? These sort of six degree sections. When you added 15 of them together, you got a full 90 degree bend. It's like a quarter of a torus, right? And here's the print for those parts. Very, very complex. And it posed two serious manufacturing challenges. One was that the grooves had to be machined individually, and then you had to line them all up when you assembled all of the sections together. I did not machine these, by the way. I'm not trying to take credit for it. We sent this to an outside shop uh, that processed it with a uh, five-axis capable machine. The other manufacturing challenge was figuring out how exactly to get the sections to assemble to one another. Uh, and the way that we ended up doing it was using these very shallow, very small, one millimeter circumferential dovetail joints. So each section had a male and a female dovetail, one on either side, and that's how you could sort of stack them. But the thing was that the dovetails were an interference fit. So when the sections were fully assembled, they were locked together. 
I'm sure you can imagine that the assembly process was pretty tricky. We had to heat up one section to get it to expand, and then dunk the other section in liquid nitrogen to get it to shrink, and then we could barely get them together with just enough time to rotate the two sections to get the grooves to line up. So, <laughs> talk about pucker factor, folks. All of this is to say that the diameters of the dovetail grooves were really, really important, and they had to be tightly controlled. So that's why we had to make that custom tool with the styli, which had a radius based off of the tooling sizes specified in the print. Here's a picture of the tool next to a set of those hook blocks that I mentioned earlier. That's the type of block that we use to create the length standard for setting the tool. In this picture, you can see the length standard all assembled with those end face extension accessories on either end so that we could set an inside measurement. And then in this picture, you can see the tool actually in use measuring one of those dovetails. We were basically just doing quality control after receiving the parts. If it's not exactly clear to you what exactly the tool is supposed to be measuring, hopefully this sketch will clarify that. You can see the radius of each stylus contacting opposite ends of the dovetail. Anyway, that's how the tool is supposed to work. Hopefully you found that application to be an interesting example. But that's it for today from the Machine Tech video blog. As always, I hope you learned something.